to preparing for home ownership. I'm Deanna and I'll be your host. Buying a home is an exhilarating event full of hope and promise, but this is also likely to be the largest, most complicated purchase you'll ever make. The more you learn now, the more time, money, and frustration you'll save down the road. During this podcast, we'll show you how to navigate the home ownership process. First, we'll examine how to get your finances in order and review how mortgage loans work. Then we'll look at several factors to consider when choosing a home and ways to locate one that's right for you. Finally, we'll explore how to make an offer and what to expect when it comes time to close. So let's begin. Having a financial plan is the first step to successful home ownership. Start by reviewing your personal finances. How much income do you have coming in each month? How much do you pay out monthly for living expenses like food, utilities, and transportation? How much do you owe on credit cards, loans, or other debts? Owning a home often costs more than renting. If you're currently worrying about making ends meet, you may need to learn to live on less in order to afford one. Next, take a look at how much you've saved. It's best to begin saving for a home long before you apply for the mortgage because there are many costs involved. For example, your mortgage probably will involve a down payment. This usually runs 20% of the cost of the home. In some cases, you may be able to put down less, possibly as little as 5% or below. Generally, the less you put down, the higher your interest rate will be. If you put down less than 20%, you may likewise be required to pay private mortgage insurance, or PMI. PMI insures the lender against the possibility that you default on the loan. There are also several charges associated with closing, such as points, title insurance, and appraisal, inspection, and attorney fees. After closing, there may be costs for moving in or unexpected home repairs, and your mortgage payment is likely to run higher than your current rent. You'll also be responsible for all home maintenance and utilities. If you don't have enough money saved, you may find you can't meet your mortgage payment and risk losing your home. Luckily, there are tax advantages to being a homeowner. If this home is your principal residence, you probably can deduct all the interest you pay on its mortgage. This alone could save you loads on state and federal income taxes each year. You also may be able to deduct some closing costs and the property taxes you pay. Check with a qualified accountant to see exactly what tax benefits apply. During your financial assessment, request and review copies of your personal credit report. It's best to do this at least 60 days before you plan to apply for a home loan so that you have time to dispute any incorrect information you find. Consumer credit reports are compiled by three nationwide credit reporting companies, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. The Federal Credit Reporting Act, or FCRA, requires that each of these companies supply you with a free credit report every 12 months. To request one from all three, go to www.annualcreditreport.com. This is the only website that's authorized to perform this service. Under the FCRA, you have the right to contact a credit reporting company in writing anytime you find an error in your credit report. They must then investigate your inquiry unless they can show that your request is frivolous. They also must forward any pertinent data you supply to the organization that gave them the initial information. When the organization receives this data, it is required to review it, perform its own investigation, and report back. If the organization finds that it provided inaccurate information, it must send a correction to all three major credit reporting companies. Finally, take a look at your personal credit score. This score will affect your ability to get a home loan. There are many types of credit scores, and each has its own method for computing how financially viable you are. The most common scoring system is known as FICO because it was developed by Fair Isaac Corporation. For a small fee, you can request a copy of this credit score from FICO itself or from one of the three major credit reporting companies. 
FICO scores range from 300 to 850. The higher your score, the better chance you'll have to qualify for a mortgage. If your score is very good, it also may help you obtain a lower interest rate. How does FICO determine your score? Several factors affect how it's calculated. Your payment history carries the most weight. It accounts for 35% of your score. 30% is based on your outstanding debts, how much you owe on home and car loans, how many credit cards you have, and if they're charged to the limit. The more credit cards you possess that are charged to the max, the lower your score will be. 15% of your score is based on the length of time you've had credit. Generally, the longer you've used credit, the better. 10% is based on the types of credit you currently hold, such as credit cards, retail accounts, and installment loans. The more types of credit you've responsibly used, the higher your credit score will be. The final 10% is based on the age of your individual credit accounts. If you show a lot of new accounts or have a history of frequently applying for credit, this will lower your credit score. Now let's take a look at mortgages. Before you hunt for home financing, it helps to know how the loan process works and to understand common industry terms. For example, do you know the difference between a mortgage banker and a mortgage broker? Mortgage bankers are organizations that can originate and sell a mortgage directly to you. They also sometimes service mortgage loans, but are more likely to sell your loan to a secondary mortgage company soon after closing. When you use a mortgage banker, there is no middleman involved, and this may expedite the mortgage process. You also may avoid certain fees because you're dealing directly with your funding source. That said, it's important to realize that mortgage bankers are not banks and are therefore not required to follow the state and federal laws that regulate the banking industry. In some states, their loan officers do not have to be licensed. They may also be more motivated by their employer's interests than yours. In contrast, a mortgage broker is an independent consultant who can put you in touch with loans from several different lenders and help you find one that's right for you. Mortgage brokers are required to be licensed. They provide advice on how to qualify and help compile the information that's required for an application. Mortgage brokers don't get paid unless they close on the loan, so they generally work diligently to provide borrowers with acceptable financing. There are many types of mortgage programs. FHA and VA loans are two of the most popular with first-time home buyers. FHA loans are insured against default by the Federal Housing Administration. This means the lender won't be left high and dry if you don't make payments. Because of this guarantee, lenders sometimes approve larger amounts or require smaller down payments. FHA loans are available to almost anyone because there are no income restrictions. However, there are limits on how much you can borrow. And you need to have decent credit and a reasonable debt-to-income ratio in order to qualify. Like FHA loans, VA loans are secured by the federal government, in this case, the Veterans Administration. These loans are only available to qualified veterans, but include several advantages. For example, they require no down payment, have limited closing costs, and offer fixed competitive interest rates, even to people with less than perfect credit. If you're a first-time home buyer, other state or city government financing programs may be available to you. Check with your local housing administration office to see what's currently offered in your area. Now let's consider types of mortgages. The two most common are fixed and adjustable rate. Fixed rate mortgages charge a set rate of interest that doesn't change during the life of the loan. The amount of principal and interest paid on the loan varies from month to month, but the total payment for each month remains the same. This makes it easy to budget and provides increased financial security because the interest rate doesn't fluctuate. On the downside, buyers who purchase their home in a high interest economy may be stuck paying a high rate of interest throughout the life of their loan. 
Adjustable rate mortgages, which are also known as ARMS, are significantly more complicated than fixed rate loans. The initial interest rate on an ARM is set below the market rate on a comparable fixed rate mortgage. This rate remains constant for a fixed period of time, but it later adjusts from time to time to reflect the current interest rate. Because ARMS initially have lower payments and make it possible to purchase more expensive homes, they often appeal to consumers with limited financial resources. They may also make sense if you plan to sell your home within a few years, but it's easy to end up in trouble on an arm, especially if you aren't ready to handle a bigger payment when your loan adjusts. Before locking into one, make sure you'll be able to afford your payment even if the interest rate goes up. Before moving on, let's discuss one final mortgage option, the interest-only loan. Under this type of financing, your early payments are very low because they strictly cover interest. But this all changes about three to 10 years down the line when principal is added into the mix. At this point, the payments grow higher than they would be for a traditional mortgage because the principal has to be paid off in a shorter period of time. Unless you've had a sizable boost in income, you may find it hard to handle this increase and you may run the risk of losing your home. Before you choose a loan provider, contact several lenders and ask them to prepare good faith estimates or GFEs to review and compare. A GFE is a HUD form that lists all the settlement fees or closing costs associated with a mortgage, such as the interest rate, taxes, title insurance, and attorney, appraisal, broker, and inspection fees. One expense that will appear on the GFE is how many points you're being charged for the loan. These represent the amount you're expected to pay as a loan origination fee. Each point is equal to 1% of the loan amount. For instance, if you pay one point on a $100,000 loan, this amounts to a $1,000 loan origination fee. If a lender or broker refuses to provide a GFE on a HUD form, Find another lender or broker. Do not sign documents that include blanks and avoid using anyone who tries to pressure you to use a specific lender or who suggests you make a false statement on the loan application. When applying, don't lie about your income, expenses, the amount of cash you have available for down payment, or if you intend to live in the home. Also, fully disclose all your debts and accurately represent how long you've been employed. Lying on a mortgage application is fraud and can lead to criminal penalties. Sometimes, buyers wait until they've found their dream home to apply for a mortgage. But it's actually better to get pre-approved for one ahead of time. Pre-approval will make you a more attractive candidate for sellers. It also will give you a realistic understanding of how much house you can afford so that you don't waste time, energy, or emotion on a property that's too expensive. A mortgage lender can either pre-qualify or pre-approve you. When you're pre-qualified for a mortgage, no promises are made. The lender simply gives you an estimate of what you can afford. Pre-approval is preferable because it involves a commitment. The lender agrees to supply you with home financing up to a specific amount as long as no major financial setbacks or problems with the property arise. At closing, the terms of your home loan will be documented in either a mortgage or a deed of trust, depending on the state in which you live. Once you know how much mortgage you can afford, put some thought into the type of home that's right for you. List the things you consider important and then try to differentiate your wants from your needs. Also, get input from other family members. After all, this is a space you could all share for years, and during that time, even small factors may affect your happiness and quality of life. Given the number of people in your family, what size home will best fit your needs? How many bedrooms and bathrooms do you require? Do you want a garage, a yard? Is it possible you'll need more space in the future as your family grows? Also, carefully consider location. 
Do you need to be within the boundaries of a specific school district for your children? How close is this neighborhood to your work? Are amenities like public transportation, parks, libraries, and shopping located nearby? When it comes to choosing a home, everybody has a different perspective. Only you can decide what's truly important. Before it's time to look for a home, shop as carefully for a real estate agent as you do for the home itself. Before you select a realtor, do some research. Talk with your family and friends. They may be able to give you names of realtors they've worked with and trust. Also, check local listings to see which realtors represent properties like the one you hope to buy. Based on your research, interview at least three realtors. Tell them about the home you hope to find and the price you can afford. Then, ask them questions like, how long have you been a licensed agent? How many homes did you sell last year? Are you a buyer or seller's agent? Some realtors will say they represent both, but it's impossible to fairly and equally represent both parties. You need a realtor who answers only to you. Also, ask for references and find out if they offer a buyer's guarantee. Never agree to pay a real estate agent directly for services. Reputable realtors earn a commission on the sale. A qualified realtor can help you determine your buying power, give you resources that assist with your home search, and provide an objective assessment on each property. Once you find a home, the realtor will assist you with negotiations and inspections, provide due diligence during property evaluation, help you understand financing options, identify qualified lenders, and guide you through the closing process. When dealing with your agent, be honest and cooperative. Promptly arrive at all appointments and read and sign all necessary paperwork. Along the way, don't be afraid to ask questions and listen carefully to the advice you're given. The more you know, the easier it will be to make informed decisions. There are many ways to locate a home. Study listing sheets from your agent. Check house for sale magazines. Search the classified ads in local newspapers, drive through neighborhoods that appeal to you, and search realty websites. If you have limited financial resources, don't give up. Foreclosure properties and fixer-uppers, those that need a little extra work, may prove to be diamonds in the rough. When you locate a home you want to buy, it's time to negotiate a price with the seller and agree on a purchase contract. Begin by making an offer. Homes are not like some major purchases that come with a price tag attached. They can sell for whatever the buyer and seller decide. Your realtor or real estate attorney can help you come up with an appropriate first offer purchase price. When you make your offer, put it in writing and have your mortgage pre-approval in place so that you have maximum leverage. Also, be prepared to submit earnest money or a good faith deposit to confirm your commitment to the agreement. This money will be placed in an escrow account until the transaction is complete. Once your offer has been accepted, the next step is to set up and sign a purchase contract. This is a legal agreement between the buyer and seller that describes all the terms of the transaction. Depending on the state where you live, an attorney, real estate agent, or title company may help you negotiate and draft this document. Purchase contracts generally include the home address and a description of the property, the sales price and amount of the loan, deposit, and down payment, the names of buyer and seller and their agents, brokers, and attorneys, and applicable time limits that may apply to things like the buyer acquiring financing, the seller responding to the offer, the date of closing, and when the buyer can actually move in. The contract also contains disclosures made by the seller. What's required to be disclosed varies from state to state, but will include material facts that may not be apparent, but that may affect the sale. For example, if the roof leaks, if there's been a problem with termites in the past, or there's currently a boundary dispute. This could affect your willingness to buy the property and may therefore need to be disclosed. 
The contract also spells out the conditions or contingencies which must be met in order for the transaction to be completed. These again vary from state to state, but may involve items such as the buyer's ability to get financing, sale of the buyer's current home, home inspection results, or appraisal results. Before you're approved for a mortgage, your lender will require an appraisal to make sure it isn't loaning more than what the property's worth. An appraisal is simply an inspection in which a professional appraiser estimates the value of the home based on its size, condition, quality, and function. The buyer usually pays for the appraisal, and this generally runs between $300 and $500. If the appraisal turns out to be lower than the maximum amount the lender is willing to finance, then your loan won't proceed unless the seller lowers the price or you increase the amount of cash you provide as down payment. Once the purchase agreement is signed, you'll need to arrange for a home inspection by a qualified independent professional. Lenders generally require this inspection before they'll approve a loan. You, as the buyer, probably will have to pay for the inspection, but it's also in your best interest. A skilled inspector can point out problems, such as faulty plumbing or foundation cracks, that may affect your purchase decision because they're costly to fix. In most cases, a termite inspection is also required before the home is sold. The seller normally pays for this service. You can also pay to have the home tested for radon, gas, mold and mildew, lead paint, and other health hazards. If issues come to light during inspection, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sale is off. Try negotiating a lower sales price or ask the seller to make repairs before you purchase the property. To help motivate buyers, some sellers provide a home warranty plan. This type of policy can save you money on common repairs or service calls and allow for enhanced coverage on expensive items like pools and spas. But it also may limit who you can use to make home repairs or only cover appliances and systems in specific circumstances. Once your loan has been approved and a commitment letter is accepted, a closing date is set for transferring the home to you. Prior to closing, your lender will require a title search to make sure that no liens or encumbrances exist. You'll also be expected to obtain title insurance as further protection against ownership problems. Shortly before closing, your contract may authorize you to make a last-minute inspection of the home. This is known as the final walkthrough. At closing, you'll also be asked to review and sign several documents. The sheer amount of paperwork can be daunting, but be sure to ask questions about anything you don't understand. Don't sign something until you fully grasp its meaning. The promises you make at closing will affect your life as a homeowner for years to come.